He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Previously on The Service. One of them was shaking very badly. And I turned round to the chap who was in charge of them. I said, this man's ill. And he just said, he's always like this before a job. So I shut him. It was the Czech embassy in Wadestown. What were they after? The codes used by the Warsaw Pact countries. Did they get them? You know, the political ramifications for, for, for the government and for the service were, were huge. From RNZ and Bird of Paradise Productions, this is The Service. The Soviet Union was extremely active in New Zealand. A five-part podcast about New Zealand's SIS. All of us lived in the shadows all that time, you know, in the wilderness of mirrors. And its role in the Cold War. I do recall very much the heated times of the nuclear arms race. I'm Guyan Espiner. And I'm John Daniel. My mum and my stepdad were SIS officers. Guyan's help, I'm trying to find out about some of the things they did for their country. The story of John's family is bound up with New Zealand's contribution to the Cold War, including perhaps the biggest intelligence operation this country ever mounted during that time. We've spoken to a number of officials and experts, all of whom were ignorant of the Czech embassy operation, but all of whom agreed that the prize, codes used by the Warsaw Pact countries in their encrypted communications, would have been of enormous strategic and political use to the Western Alliance. We'll come to that part of the story. But before then, to understand what really happened that night in Wadestown and why, we're going to start by looking at the way the world worked during the Cold War. The clash between the free nations and the Soviet bloc. This, a savage war... Two superpowers had emerged after World War II, capitalist America and communist Russia. The rift between East and West. The Iron Curtain is more than a barrier to freedom and truth. And the Americans, along with many of its allies, feared communism was on the march. First through Europe. I watched workmen supervised by troops putting the finishing touches to the cement curtain through which no East German can pass. Into Asia. At the Han River Line, southeast of the capital city of Seoul, US trained South Korean troops attempt to stand against the Reds even into its backyard. We now know that the Soviet Union has decided to transform Cuba into a base for communist aggression. Proxy wars popped up around the globe. We can't reach those big guns and there's nothing you can do. It's like being a big bullseye on top of a hill and uh, you're just sitting there. And the fear on both sides was that one misstep might mean global annihilation. If we are attacked by nuclear weapons, these are the warning sounds you must recognise. Context is everything. That's former Prime Minister Helen Clark. The Czech embassy raid was news to her. She didn't know about it. But we wanted to know, is it the kind of thing a Prime Minister could justify signing off? Well, it might seem strange coming from me, but I think it probably was. It, because I do recall very much the heated times of the nuclear arms race uh, before there was any serious detente and before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So she thinks the raiding of a foreign embassy is OK, in the right context, of course. That's a big call from Helen Clark, isn't it? In light of the legalities and the potential downside of getting caught? Yeah, and we'll hear more from her later about why she thinks that, as well as other insights from her. When I first contacted Helen Clark, she was, she was really engaged in this. She felt it was important to talk about the intelligence world in a way that wasn't sensational, that brought a bit of daylight in, which was great, really, because the usual position from the body politic and something of a defensive crouch. She wasn't giving everything away, though, was she? No, <laughs> but like she said... Context is everything.
Throughout the Cold War, New Zealand was a small part of the Western Alliance, but in the standoff between the Communist East and the Capitalist West, both sides played what's called a zero-sum game, so any loss for one side equated to a win for the other. And while it played out most visibly in the conflict zones and the major capitals, it was taking place right around the globe, from Fiji to Greenland, from Tehran to Wellington. Uh, My last point is this. And don't let anyone have any doubts about it. This is the New Zealand Prime Minister Keith Holyoke in 1965, laying out the so-called domino theory that dominated the thinking of Western leaders when it came to the spread of communism. If South Vietnam falls to the communists, it will then be the turn of Thailand and Malaysia and every other smaller country in the area. In this eventuality, the threat to New Zealand would be that much closer to home. And how active was the KGB and and the Soviet influence in New Zealand at that point? They were very active, and it's that very... This is Kit Bennett. He joined the Security Intelligence Service in the early 1970s. And it's that very interesting uh, situation where... Our view, most people in New Zealand would say, what would they be interested in here? We've got no secrets. But, of course, we were, we were members of the Big Five, now what is now called Five Eyes. So here was New Zealand, certainly at the bottom of the list, but all the important decisions regarding the Western Allies, New Zealand was sitting at the table. So there was the United States, Great Britain, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. What were we, the size of Cincinnati, Ohio or something? I don't know. We were, we were a very small country, but we had a strong voice. But that meant that the Soviets worked out very quickly that why would you try and spy in Washington and Whitehall, where everyone's following you, when you come to Wellington, where no one gave a rat's hat? We don't know how many operations were run by the KGB and its proxies in New Zealand. We probably never will. But one of them became famous, or infamous, depending on your point of view. It's April the 18th, 1974, 7.30pm, a cool, clear autumn evening in Wellington, and a 23-year-old Kip Bennett is about to stumble across the biggest spy story in New Zealand history. Bennett and an SIS colleague pick up a car carrying two men as it leaves the Soviet embassy in Messines Row, Karori, and follow it through Wellington till they reach Glenmore Street, right next to Parliament. The light was red, and we were coming around the corner a little higher up, and the light was seriously red. And he just cruised, Pertsev was driving, and he just cruised straight through and onto Lampton Quay, through this red light. No, didn't slow, it just slowed to make sure there was no traffic, and through he went. Now, what he was looking for was to see if anyone was going to follow him. So we didn't fall into that trap. Uh, now, when that happened, we knew that that was counter-surveillance. There's no other reason for it. You know, they, these guys could drive. There's no other reason an operational driver would go through a red light. So for the uninitiated, this is an hour or so maybe two, three hours of driving around trying to make sure no one's following you before you meet up with your target. Absolutely. And then if you get any sign of it, a good KGB officer would buy a pint of milk and and just go home. Not give you any indication that that he or she knew what you were doing, but rather just... And and you'd wonder what, what they went out for. But not on this night. After watching their target stop and start through the city, the pair tracked the car all the way back to the suburb it had come from. Then we lost him uh, up in Karori. And in those days, I mean, it's pretty historic now, but in those days there was late night shopping in Karori. The shops were open, you know. The only place anything was open. So we thought, oh, well, maybe he's going there. And and so what we did was uh, my colleague jumped out of the vehicle and he went into the mall searching, just in case he was there, just for a wander to see where they were, because we'd seen the car... Yeah, we saw the car go into the mall. So I drove around a block, just did a blocky, basically, and and uh, behind the other side of the uh, the road, went along, just did a little square blocky along a little street called Lewis Street. Was it Lewis Street? I think it was Lewis Street. Anyway, it's where the Karori Bowling Club is. It's absolutely... I drove past it about eight months ago. It is identical to what it was in 1974. Nothing has changed. But that night, things were about to change. And as I drove past there, I saw these two men one and a half in coat, these two men standing right outside the Karori Bowling Club in the dark. And I recognised one immediately as Raskovrov.
Dmitry Alexandrovich Rezgovorov. His official job description at the Soviet Embassy was First Cultural Secretary. But really, he worked for the KGB. The thing about surveillance is you get to, you can, if you follow people enough, you get to know them by their, by their walk, by just looking down, just seeing the side of their head or whatever, you know them. I recognised Razgovorov immediately. And when I saw him in this dark street, talking to this guy, I knew exactly what I had. I knew it was a clandestine meeting I, and I knew it was his, his agent. Now, when something like this happens, it's, you don't even have to discuss it. You know what you've got to do. You've got to house and identify the agent, because we looked at this guy, didn't know who he was. The identity of the man would shake this country's institutions to their core and raise questions about his actions and intentions that are still debated today. I was too young to really know or too naive to really understand what was going on because by then, the senior officers in the service knew that they had a tiger by the tail. That this was really, and that this, he was a, uh, a very senior government figure, and he had um, yeah, a confidant and friend of prime ministers, that sort of thing. So they all knew, and I didn't know. And indeed, they had been gathering information on him for quite some time. There'd been warnings from uh, partner agencies overseas. This was a man who, uh, it's later to be found out, had probably been recruited by the Soviets in the 50s. Correct, yes. According to uh, Matrokin, the the Matrokin archive, he was recruited uh, in the very early 50s. So this Matrokin archive, it comes up quite a bit. Yeah, it's a remarkable story in itself, and there's a Kiwi connection here too. In a nutshell, the KGB archivist, Vasily Matrokin, copied out a vast amount of the KGB archives by hand and took them with him when he defected to Britain in the early 1990s. And he was exfiltrated from Russia by the Hamilton-born MI6 officer, Richard Tomlinson. And the archive, what did it tell us? The guy was copying it out by hand, remember, so you'd imagine he didn't get everything. But in terms of this case, there's a one-line entry. It gives the code name as Māori and describes him as an Englishman, born in 1907, New Zealand citizen, PhD, former high official in the government, retired 1965, recruited in 1950, in contact with Drosian. All that information appears to identify Bill Such. Dr William Ball Such was his full name. He'd risen to the top of the New Zealand Public Service. He was the head of the New Zealand delegation to the brand new UN from 1947 to 1951, then took up a role with the Department of Industries and Commerce, becoming secretary in 1957. His book, The Quest for Security in New Zealand, sold over 100,000 copies. He took early retirement in 1965, but remained close to those in power. So what on earth was this member of the Beltway elite doing out on a dark Wellington night, meeting a KGB officer? As you'll hear in a minute, his family believes to this day it was all a terrible misunderstanding. The SIS says he was recruited by the KGB in 1950. So, in fact before I was born. So he'd been doing this for quite a long time. And uh, yeah, and we had been warned. And there had been a number, I believe, of operations that had gone on earlier, well before I joined the service, to see if they could, could, uh, could identify something. But they'd never been successful. One of the roles that I think Dr Such had in his later life was as an agent of influence. So, in other words, the Soviets would be, would be keen that New Zealand took a certain line. And because Bill Such had uh, so many contacts, he could be talking to prime ministers and ministers saying, you know, what, what line are we taking here? And, and maybe able to influence what's happening. The agent of influence is a very powerful agent. So it's not just passing things one way, it's often getting them to work. You may recall that uh, Willy Brandt, the, the Chancellor of Germany, his right-hand man, was a <clears throat> was working for the KGB, so he was whispering in Billy Brandt's ear. So you know, you imagine the influence that someone like that has. 
who wants submarine plans when you can have that kind of influence on, on what a major Western power is doing? Kit Bennett's theory that Bill Such was an agent of influence remains speculation. But the SIS mounted a surveillance operation lasting months, tailing him to meetings with Razgovorov, who was the resident KGB agent at the Soviet embassy. Then on a wet and windy Wellington night, the operation came to a head. The two men were intercepted at another meeting, this time in Aro Valley. Bill Such was codenamed Streaker. Kip Bennett says the SIS gave him the nickname because he walked so fast. And at the same time, streaking onto cricket grounds was a thing. Yeah, it was the 1970s, remember. So Streaker had a package to hand over to Raz Govorov. The SIS plan was to catch him red-handed and then he'd have no option but to cooperate. What we wanted was Dr Such to tell us what he'd been doing. And you may or may not know, but... I, I, Dr Such was almost certainly in line for a knighthood and we would never have stopped that. We would never have stopped it. We would have been quite happy for him to do that if he'd been talking to us. And that, that's the greatest tragedy of that whole affair was that Dr Such didn't talk to us because that's all we were interested in was gathering intelligence, not, not sending people to prison. We were not interested in anything punitive. But the operation didn't go according to plan. Such got to Razgovorov and made the handover before he could be intercepted. Razgovorov passed the package to his driver, who took it straight back to the embassy. It should have been a major coup. Instead, the service came away empty-handed. But if he had told us, imagine what we would have learned, not just about what he'd passed, but about the modus operandi of the Soviets, what they were interested in over all of those years. That sort of information for Western intelligence services would have been gold. Instead, the Such Affair turned into a drama that played out across the media, splitting the country along political and ideological lines and bringing the service's methods into question. Four months later, in February 1975, Such became the first and only New Zealander to be tried for espionage under the Official Secrets Act. The trial lasted five days and the verdict was a bombshell. Dr Such, you've been found not guilty of an offence under the Official Secrets Act. But what view do you take of the Act itself? Well, my view of the Act is that it's probably the worst uh, in the at least the old Commonwealth countries. That's Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Not it's guilty. A huge relief for Such. But he was suffering from a heart condition and the trial took its toll. You were not a well man uh, and you have not been a well man for some time. What effect did the trial have? On, on your health? Well, it was a very interesting effect. Normally when I work around the garden here, uh, I can tell by the state of my heart whether I should stop, because my heart starts to ache. Now I could sit still and my heart would start to ache. Such passed away just six months later. The trial had turned on whether he'd handed the Russians official information. Legally, it didn't delve into why Such was meeting Razgovorov, and he never took the stand. But less than a week after his acquittal, Such went on TV. Interviewed by Ian Fraser on a programme called Seven Days. Why the clandestine meetings, Fraser asked. The Russian had approached him, Such said. He thought Razgovorov wanted to defect. Bill Such's family chose not to speak to us for this podcast, but have made that same claim over the years. His late wife, the formidable lawyer Shirley Smith, defended Such until the end, including to Neville Glasgow on RNZ's Directions programme back in 1992. Looking back on your life with your husband and his career, some people see him as one of the greatest New Zealanders and others see him as a traitor who got away with it. You must have some strong feelings about that. Well, you won't be really surprised to hear that I agree with the first um, opinion that you have voiced. He certainly wasn't a traitor who got away with it. He was just the last person to be a traitor. And I'm just only too happy that, in fact, justice was done. Um, it so easily could not have been. He had the most tremendous 
wished to see New Zealand prosper and do well and he was devoted to the idea of developing all our people and their skills and their abilities and turning New Zealand into you know, a, a wonderful small nation in the South Pacific, be an example to the world again as it once was. And oh, he, he, he was the quintessential patriot. It's interesting though, a recent biography of Shirley Smith by Sarah Gaitanos shows she had private doubts about her husband's involvement with the Soviets. And it's worth remembering how different the political landscape was in those years, either side of World War II. We really thought that the Soviet Union represented the forces of light. This is Smith in that same 1992 interview. We all thought Russia was the one great white hope, you see, or, and, or red hope. Um, the only real opposition to Hitler, uh, the only power that could possibly stand up against him. The Soviets had helped win the war against fascism, and capitalism's failure in the Great Depression was still a recent memory. Smith lost faith in Soviet-style communism by the late 1950s, but she'd once been a party member. And these sympathies weren't rare in post-war New Zealand. A lot of thinking people like Such and Smith were trying to wrestle with, even reconcile, communism and capitalism. They hoped Russia might inspire equality for all. Only later did it become clear how far short it had fallen. But as Such's influence grew, that sort of thinking seems to have worried the powers that be. Why? Was it just intellectual smoke? The fact that he had a profile, he had an ego, or where there was smoke, was there fire? Since his death, the evidence against him has grown, though much of that has been circumstantial. In 1993, for example, a Russian diplomat working at the embassy in Wellington said he'd received the package that Such had handed Razgovorov back in 1974. Then came the release of that Matrokin archive material in 2014. The most currently controversial case of a suspected Cold War Soviet spy in the latest MI5 release is that of the senior New Zealand diplomat and civil servant, William Bill Such. This is Professor Christopher Andrew, who's in charge of the archive, speaking in 2014. Though Matrokin does not identify Such by name, His notes, widely reported recently by the New Zealand media, mention a high-level agent codenamed Maori, recruited in 1950, whose date of birth and career details in New Zealand closely match those of such. It seems as close as we're going to get to a smoking gun. Though such as daughter, Helen, said at the time the KGB agents were just talking up their contacts to try to impress their bosses. She argued it proved nothing. But then there are the land deals, the Swiss bank account, and the estate in the Bahamas. and a series of pen portraits detailing the weaknesses and political leanings of six other senior civil servants they were found in such as office. All of which we'll get to, but if he was an agent, just what sort of damage might Bill Such have done? New Zealand's foreign policy, when you look back on it, seems to have been an alternation between worrying about security... Meet Gerald Hensley, Keeper of State Secrets... He joined foreign affairs in the 1950s. By the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, he was Secretary of Defence. In between, he'd had postings in Washington, London and Singapore before becoming head of the Prime Minister's Department in the 1980s, a position he held under both Labour and national governments. He was chair of the Intelligence Council at the time of the Czech Embassy operation. He's also an historian in his own right, having published books on New Zealand in World War II and the ANZUS Row. He's in his 80s now, retired, living on a vineyard in Martinborough. Bill Such rose very high in the public service in New Zealand. Yes, he was a very able man, extremely able. Um, Like most of their uh, agents, uh, recruited agents in those times, you know, it was ideological. They felt that the um, Soviet communism was the wave of the future 
uh, and um, you know you should do what you could to help it get on. Don't know what his convictions were at the end, but he had started out uh, uh, certainly with uh, similar uh, views. And of course, one of the problems with spying, particularly for the Russians, is how do you get out of it? And it's not like being a vicar who's lost his faith. If you do lose your faith, uh, they've got you payments, various other things. So it's not easy to abandon the ship once you've got on board that particular one. How valuable could such have been to the Soviets, given his position in trade and industry? I believe he was number two there. Well, he was number one at the end of his, the end of his career. Uh, in his career, he could have been quite valuable. What he was doing after he retired is more of a mystery. Uh, and you can only speculate. And uh, my speculation, and it's not based on anything other than speculation, uh, is he was probably talent spotting, uh, saying to the Russians, uh, young so-and-so might be worth your uh, taking to dinner and uh, so on. Uh, so I don't know, but he handed something to Razgovrov and uh, what it was, of course, we will never know. If the operation had gone better and we'd got that package, all that mystery would have been solved. While we don't know what was in that package, the SIS say he had been working for KGB for more than 20 years and likely gave them other information. They say Such handed a file to Razgovorov at a previous meeting, but they couldn't prove it. Gerald Hensley's belief that Such was talent spotting is backed up by former SIS officer Kit Bennett's. One of the things that we did identify was that he had in his possession what, what you might call pen portraits uh, of, of people in key positions um, and some of those pen portraits had uh, indications of people's vulnerabilities, um, where, they, where, they, where there were flaws in their personalities or characters, those sorts of things. And these are things that the Soviets would ask for because that's what they would want to, to use as, as if, not, if not open, tacit um, motivations for people to, to assist, you know, the, the fear of, of exposure or blackmail, that sort of thing. Members of the service, including my stepdad Jim, as it turns out, had been performing entries to such as office while he was under surveillance. Entry, come on, mate. Entries, you mean break-ins? It's a bit of a freedom fighter terrorist distinction, but I think the point is that if you're legally allowed to do it, it's called an entry. Mm, but the service didn't do everything by the book in this case, did they? No, but later on the ombudsman said these circumstances were exceptional. And after the fact, the book, or at least the law, was changed so that they had legal cover in this kind of situation. Anyway... The pen portraits, which came to be known as the profiles, were never even presented in court. So why were these pen portraits so important then? Well, on their own, they're not that damaging. They're just three pages talking about six fairly senior civil servants, two from what was then foreign affairs, three from trade and industry, and the government statistician. But again, context is everything. Whoever's written them, they're not signed, but the SIS felt they had good reason to believe it was such has presented a pretty bald picture. So-and-so is lazy, someone else has mental health issues, and they're lonely, that kind of thing. More particularly, it details their sympathies towards the Soviet Union. Kit Bennett, when we talked to him, he says there was potential here for blackmail. Yeah, and I think that's a bit of a stretch. More like vulnerabilities, maybe. But it also gives insights into their interests. One guy's interested in art, another guy's interested in hunting, and this is actually quite key because you can see how that gets used for an approach by an agent made to look natural. You meet someone in a pub, an art gallery, apparently by chance, and they turn out to be interested in the same things, and a relationship develops. Right, so these are essentially targets, what, for KGB recruitment? That was the assessment of the SIS. But often people were manipulated without necessarily being recruited. And we'll hear more from Gerald Hensley about how that could work. It certainly seems to indicate that five years after his retirement, Bill Such was actively looking to help the Soviets find friendly people 
in high places. Was this a one-off? Who knows? The other document that was found was more recent. It had details of Japanese fishing interests, which doesn't sound that exciting, but included a decision made in Cabinet that hadn't yet been made public and cited a senior public servant as the source. So again, the allegation is that Bill Such had access to top-level information and was preparing to pass it on. Yeah, and look, we just don't know any more, but it might have been the tip of the iceberg. And if it was, that has some pretty devastating ramifications. People towards the top of the civil service and government being groomed to pass on information, wittingly or unwittingly, to the KGB. But there are still plenty of people who think Bill Such was innocent. I asked the former SIS officer, Kit Bennett, what he would say to them. I can perfectly understand the situation of family and and friends because they knew a different side of the man. And as a young man, I thought he was a traitor and, you know, it was a terrible thing that he was doing, with the benefit of some years in thinking about it. And also, my later career taught me a little more about why people would work for the Soviets like that. And it wasn't always, you know, was, in fact, it certainly was never as a, as a traitor against New Zealand. And Dr Such never for one second thought he was doing anything against the, uh, against the best interests of New Zealand. He thought that he was, he was helping, you know. Uh, I think he was a man with a, with a big ego. He had, he had good reason. He was a very clever man. He had been a very successful man. He believed that, that he had something to contribute and that he could assist New Zealand's position and he could as- help the Soviets and do this all at once, like the grand puppeteer. But we also must understand he was paid a considerable sum of money to do this. He, he got a lot of money for this over a long period of time into a Swiss bank account. So, you know, there's no doubt that he knew what he was doing. So this Swiss bank account, it was reported by the newspaper Truth back in 1975. Were they right? A checkbook from a Swiss bank account comes up in the list of items taken from Bill Such's house in Brooklyn by police, although there's no mention of how much money there was in it. Whether the service knows that or not, they're not telling. Such also had a surprisingly large property portfolio. Turns out to have included land in the Bahamas, among other investments. In 1979, it was revealed that Such had been a big-time tax evader. He'd failed to pay $47,241 between 1966 and 1974. That was the second highest for any one person in those years. It was more than half a million dollars in today's money. So maybe this explains where that money came from for the Swiss bank account and the Harmer estate. Maybe that explains where the money came from, or maybe it just underlines his capacity for secrecy. John, last episode we talked about how your stepfather, Jim Stewart, worked for the SIS. Did he have any involvement with this such case? Well, I didn't know anything about the such case at all when it came up on the radio Around 1991, I think, we were in the car together, Mum, Jim and me heading north out of Wellington, going past the ferry terminal out towards the hut. And so they explained their version, basically laying out the prosecution case. Guilty as sin was the phrase I remember, quoting uh, Rob Muldoon, which I think was supposed to finish the discussion. And I said, but he was found not guilty. And Mum was like, well, sometimes there's more going on than meets the eye. And so I asked if they knew anything specific. Mum said it was after her time, so I looked at Jim, who was driving, and he was like, nothing. Crickets. I guess he was wrestling with it. Then eventually he goes, I can't really say anything. So I was unconvinced. But Kit Bennett says Jim was right in there. He was there in such his office. Yeah, well, that's right. He, he says, Kit says, that Jim was one of the guys entering such his office and putting in a bug and a phone tap activities that were illegal. Later, an ombudsman's report showed the SIS was not just operating outside the law, but also allowing Prime Minister Norman Kirk to flat-out lie when he issues a statement, telephone tapping and the interception of mail is not practised within New Zealand. The reality is, that was happening. 
The ombudsman is critical of that, but not unsympathetic, given what he describes as the exceptional circumstances surrounding the specific case. Potentially, there's a KGB agent in Wellington with access to the highest levels of the government. It doesn't get much more exceptional with that. And so what's the government solution? They change the law, don't they, to make things like phone tapping legal. That's right. And that tension between the on-the-ground reality of operations and legal oversight is something we'll come back to. It's at the heart of the relationship between a liberal democracy and its intelligence services who necessarily operate in secret. So Bill Such was by far the biggest fish, but there are other Kiwis accused of being KGB assets. The best known is Paddy Costello, Victor Costello and Ian Milner, both of whom stand accused of aiding the Eastern Bloc in affairs going back as far as the 1940s. But assisting the KGB didn't always mean you were some kind of full-on agent. Gerald Hensley says you could potentially help the KGB without even knowing it. The Soviets had a name for these people. They called them useful idiots. Levchenko said to me that recruiting agents of influence, and by this, they're not necessarily under control. They are not necessarily know that they're Soviet agents. Stanislav Levchenko was a KGB major, operating undercover as a journalist in Japan in the 1970s. He defected to the US in 1979. Levchenko, who defected in Tokyo, prudently brought across to them a list of his agents of influence. Uh, it's his ticket to make himself welcome. And it, when released, caused a sensation in uh, Japan because that list were members of the LDP, the governing party, uh, Buddhist abbots, and all sorts of uh, very well-regarded journalists and so on. And as he himself said, not all of them would have known they were under control. Uh, Some of them, you cultivated them, and knowing their views were sort of anti-imperialist, you could suggest, what about a piece on uh, how awful the Americans are being these days? And this person would write that piece, perhaps perfectly innocently, because he or she agreed uh, with Levchenko. The battle for ideas could be fought at arm's length. Levchenko told Hensley it was easy to pick up journalists and opinion makers at a social event. And he said I'd sit down to table with one of them and then I'd say, uh, oh, things are just terrible back home in Moscow, you know. They're in the Kremlin, they just don't, don't know what's going on. And that chap would go rigid, thinking, here's, here's a Soviet uh, uh, official talking absolute treason right here, and that'd be the end of his life if I was ever to uh, say it. So he's got his audience straight away. And then the patter, according to Levchenko, would be, um, but, you know, if only a bit of fresh air could be got into these people, these old men in the Kremlin. I mean, you know, something like you write, you know, it's good stuff and would give them a sense that the world is more complicated than they think. So you built up that and you finally said, well, look, you know, if you would uh, care to write me a paragraph, uh, uh, I'll see what, uh, you know, what I can do. So if he'd got that far, the chap would hand over a you know, written paragraph and uh, Stan said going home in the car, he'd tear it up. <laughs> and then two weeks later, he'd run into the chap and say, oh, that thing you wrote, it got into the Kremlin Daily. It was circulated. Um, so that is a real breath of fresh air. I'd be very grateful if you could do it again, and so on and so on. After the chap had done it several times, she said, oh, look, now, um, you know, you've got expenses. And she was, oh, no, I don't want any money. Oh, no, no, I don't suggest money, but you've got paper and type. This is Levchenko, uh, typewriter uh, ribbons and things. You know, you must. And he said, if the chap would take your 50 bucks or something, then you've got him. Journalists aren't susceptible to flattery, though, are they? (laughs) Well, look, the beauty of the technique is that the fingerprints are invisible. So it's almost impossible to know whether it happened in New Zealand. One year, it fell into our hands, a KGB, their annual directive of the themes to push, theses, I think they were called, around the world. And again, showing their very deep knowledge of public opinion or or left public opinion in in the West, Uh, they were attractive themes, anti-American and so on. Uh, And one of them I remember was Reagan-Cowboy Warmonger. 
And I just noticed that. And about, oh, I don't know, 10 days or so later, I was reading in one of the New Zealand newspapers an article by a worthy clergyman uh, saying that, you know, the problem with President Reagan and the thing that is the great threat to us all is that having played cowboys so long, he had no sense uh, of what war really was. For him, it was the game that cowboys play and so on. And I thought, well, am I reading an example of the KGB's thesis? It may have been pure accident, but it did strike me that that was the way they, they pushed their, their message. And with Russian intelligence, as in, I'm sure still, endless patience, endless uh, willingness to spend money and endless patience to wait for the results. And I think we're seeing that now with, with Putin's interference in elections and so on. Uh, I think we're all going to have to try a bit harder on that one. The internet makes this kind of disinformation more effective than ever. It could be Russia, but it could also be China. It could also be lots of other people. It also could be somebody sitting on their bed that weighs 400 pounds, OK? A declassified intelligence report written with input from the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA states that Vladimir Putin personally ordered a cyber and social media campaign to disrupt the recent U.S. presidential election. The indictment charges 13 Russian nationals and three Russian companies for committing federal crimes while seeking to interfere in the United States political system. The defendants allegedly conducted what they called information warfare against the United States with the stated goal of spreading distrust towards the candidates and the political system in general. Back in the Cold War, the Soviets were interfering in New Zealand politics with propaganda and also with cold hard cash. And indeed, my first job, even before I came here to the PM's department, uh, was uh, that uh, the security service caught the Soviet ambassador handing over uh, the monthly dole to the uh, Socialist Unity Party, which was uh, being quite heavily funded by, uh, uh, by Soviet money. The ambassador was Zephylod Safinsky. He'd met the SUP National Secretary George Jackson and handed over $10,000. But the SIS had bugged the Auckland hotel room and Safinsky was sprung. Mr Muldoon said tonight that the SIS has evidence of your passing uh, money personally. Could you comment on that, please? It's a loss. It is absolutely lie, slander, and nothing yes. more. Absolutely. I am to lie. Prime Minister Rob Muldoon gave the ambassador three days to leave the country. The Soviet ambassador is being expelled from New Zealand because he has personally been involved in the transmission of money from the Soviet government to the Socialist Unity Party. But the evidence on which this decision is based is conclusive. It was obtained by the SIS in the course of its routine surveillance of Soviet diplomats. Gerald Hensley and the SIS couldn't believe their luck. And this was uh, a bad era of tradecraft by the Soviets. That sort of money should have been handed over by the KGB resident. Uh, and it was always a rule with the Soviets, and a wise rule, that the ambassador always kept quite clear of the subversive or the undercover work. Uh, but for some reason, the KG band wasn't available, and Safinsky, the ambassador, went to uh, uh, Auckland and uh, did the job himself, and was caught and recorded by us doing it. Uh, when it was exposed, the Russians were so astounded, they figured that the Americans had done it and told us, which wasn't a great compliment, I thought, to, to our abilities. The SUP was a minor, hard-left political party. Its head at the time, Ken Douglas, maintains the cash handover never happened. I would categorically um, deny and swear on whatever that that ever occurred. Jackson w would not have done that. He wasn't that sort of person. He would have been affronted by that in any case. What he was given was the same as I had been given and others, and including a number of um, uh, political figures, I think even some members of the National Party, was a bottle of salt and a, 
a punnet of, um, of, of, uh, of caviar. So you got a bottle of vodka and some caviar, not 10 grand. That's right, exactly. Much of the Cold War espionage took place around embassies. They were a perfect cover for spies, of course, but also provided layers of protection under international law. The Soviets also ran agents outside diplomatic cover. They call them illegals, and they may still be in New Zealand today. I think it's quite possible that there are illegals uh, in New Zealand. Um, As you know, we found one um, uh, some years ago, more by accident. By an illegal, I mean not a member of the embassy, no ties to the the embassy, uh, possibly with a illegal uh, identity taken from a dead child's tombstone uh, and living quietly uh, and... uh, is, this is a real example, is it? Yes, there was a real example. What happened? Uh, well, they were expelled. The point is that you don't know, by definition, how many illegals there are. They're there, or used to be there, so that uh, in a crisis the Russians could call on them. Uh, but in normal days, uh, no contact with the embassy, no sign that we could track that they were an illegal. The one that we found years ago, and I hope I'm not talking out of turn on this one, uh, was more by accident than uh, by anything else. So you can't say there aren't others, but again, the cost of this is enormous, and I'm not sure that New Zealand is worth the effort as far as the Russians are concerned. It was a bit of an eye-opener that we could find somebody as deeply buried uh, in the North Island as he was, uh, but that's about as far as I can go on information. I simply don't know. But this was a sleeper. Yeah, that's what I meant by an illegal, a sleeper. So the KGB didn't have it all their own way. Another success came in the late 1950s when the SIS managed a double agent. We ran a a woman against a Soviet here and then she moved to Australia and worked with the Australians. That case became known as the Skripov Affair and it resonated particularly with Mum because she'd worked in the same place that the story started. I'd worked in the British High Commission in the immigration and the passport section. There had been, it was the most extraordinary coincidence, Somebody who'd worked, some young woman who'd worked there had been targeted by somebody from the Russian embassy. That young woman was Kay Marshall, codenamed Sylvia. When I first met Ivan Fedorovich Skripov in March of 1961, I didn't know that he'd been in Australia almost two years. I didn't know what he was really doing. Sylvia gave an interview which was broadcast as part of a film on counter-espionage. She was in a rather vulnerable position with a child. Truly, I can't remember the whole details. But the target thing was to make friends with her and offer her help with this young son. She was being actively recruited and uh, there was a, a, a kind of a romance developed. Um, and she, she did all the right things by talking to the right people when she realised what was happening. The SIS realised this was a golden opportunity. They could let the Soviets think they had recruited Sylvia, but really, she'd be acting as a double agent. It was just a superb operation. In 1960, Sylvia moved to Sydney, where ASIO, Australia's version of the SIS, took over. There, the KGB introduced her to a man named Ivan Skripov. Our meetings for the first year or so were uneventful, and ASIO couldn't quite decide what Mr Skripov wanted. We had almost given up hope when Mr Skripov finally showed his true colours by giving me some red capsules and a small bottle of fluid to bring up secret writings. Skripov told Sylvia he was going to send her secret letters, written in invisible ink. His instructions were most meticulous. He told me I would receive a friendly letter through the post from time to time, signed by Teresa. 
On the reverse side of the letter, there would be important instructions from me printed in secret ink. The KGB didn't suspect a thing. In fact, they trusted her with a special mission. In March 1962, Mr. Skripoff asked me to go to a water meter near Sydney Harbour Bridge. At this meeting, Skripov gave Sylvia a package to hand over to a contact in Adelaide. It contained a sophisticated machine that enabled almost undetectable burst transmissions, allowing for communication between an agent in the field and a listening post. ASIO mounted a surveillance operation, hopeful of uncovering a network of Australian-based agents. But the contact in Adelaide never showed up. Skripov was declared persona non grata and expelled in early 1963. I mean, it was ridiculous. She actually had lived not far from where you and I lived. So that was quite a coincidence for me in such a small town, really. And also that someone who doing what appears to be a relatively minor job mm. should have been targeted Absolutely. for that sort of That's thing. That's what they were like. Again, these are the KGB operations we know about. Just talking to Mum, it's clear there were more. There's a story about you and out looking for a Russian spy. Oh, yes, that was funny. Sitting round, round the board, um, along Kenton Cambridge Terrace. Well, you'd been sent out. Yes. Looking for yes. a man who fitted a particular yes. description. There was a, a, a very um, rough type of communication thing I never had to deal with that he did that particular day. Anyway, we were sitting eating ice creams below Queen Victoria's um, statue. It was a lovely day. Thinking, what's happening? Where are we supposed to be? Where is this stupid little man? And I said to uh, the chap I was working with, um, who's that funny little man in that extraordinary different coloured blue? He's wearing sort of overalls. Oh, God, that's him. Up we got. The ice cream went down the front of my colleague's tie. Was <laughs> anyway, this chap dashed off to the oh, what's it called? That big theatre, embassy. The, and he, the, in the end, we discovered he had dashed in here. He was a foreigner, not not a resident in the country with the embassy. Um, and he dashed into the embassy, and he'd got himself conveniently lost, and our lot couldn't find him. So he knew that building better, possibly, than local Wellingtonians. That really annoyed me. But um, it, was, it was funny, sitting around, sitting around, sitting around, some of the all action stations, and, and it was the most extraordinary colour blue. Mum's funny stories have the edges blurred by self-deprecation. I think I got to hear that one because of the ice cream on the tie of her colleague, Jamie Mercer, which is again a pseudonym. I don't know what the man they saw was supposed to be doing here, but I've been told that through the 1970s and the 1980s, the KGB would send young agents to New Zealand to acclimatise to the West in a low-risk territory. They'd completed formal training and would not be tied to the embassy under diplomatic cover. One of the service's tasks was to spot them and pass on their details to Five Eyes partners so that when they turned up elsewhere in bigger ponds, they could be identified quickly. So that might have been what the guy in blue was doing, getting acclimatised to the West. Mum shared an office with Jamie Mercer. They worked on the Russia desk together. Mum was a research officer more of a desk job than field work, although the service was small, so sometimes it was all hands to the pump. She worked in a section known as PP, Principal and Planning. What PP really did was counter-espionage, looking at foreign spy threats here in New Zealand. And they were divided into groupings according to the countries. PP1 was the Soviet Union, so it was less formally known as the Russia desk. A few years after he got ice cream on his tie trying to follow a Russian agent, Jamie Mercer was heavily involved in the such case. 
After Bill Such was arrested, Jamie was walking up and down Wellington's Holloway Road in the rain, talking to Dmitry Razgovorov, the KGB agent caught meeting with Such. Such had been taken away, but the SIS weren't finished with Razgovorov. That was the second part of the operation that we were going to be involved in. What happens if, if uh, when he spoke to my, my colleague and good friend Jamie Mercer, we were hoping that, that he would say, OK. And Jamie Mercer on the night tries to turn him, does he not? Absolutely, he does. Did everything right. And the, the two men walked, they both understood each other because they were singing from the same hymn sheet. You know, they're both intelligence officers. Um, Razgovorov knew exactly what Jamie was suggesting. What kind of, and I know it was um, your colleague, not yourself, but what, what kind of techniques, what have you got to offer him at a point like that? How do you try to turn a guy? Well, you basically say, you know, Here's your big chance. You're not, you, you probably won't be coming out again. And now, I don't know what Jamie said. I don't know, I mean, no, some of the things he said, and it would be for him to say anyway. But basically, you'd be saying to the guy, this is persona non grata, you'll be on your way, um, and you probably won't get into the West again because you'd be refused entry. So if you think you like it a bit, you can come across. And we weren't thinking of, of, you know, of settling him in a little house in Petone either. If he'd come across, he could choose where he wanted to go and perhaps go to the United States or Canada or the UK. Jamie Mercer died during the time we were putting this story together. I had approached him through an intermediary, but for whatever reason, he didn't want to talk. So what did Jamie Mercer do for the SIS? Well, he was on the Russia desk and actually in charge of it for a while. But my understanding is that his specialty was turning people. What does that mean, to turn someone? Well, on some occasions at least, it involves quite a lot of drinking. <laughs> You target someone, you get close to them, you listen to them, provide an opportunity for them to come over, over to your side. Yeah. There's a story about him getting deep into a session with a prospect and halfway through realising they were trying to do exactly the same thing to him. So Jamie Mercer, would he have been in on the Czech embassy job for the Warsaw Pact codes? I don't know. It depends how high he was in the service by then or whether he would have been read in for whatever reason. Others I spoke to initially who were there at the same time weren't in on it. As we've been told, the information was tightly held. Tightly held is an understatement, isn't it? I asked the SIS under the Official Information Act for documents that they held on the Czech Embassy raid and got a response back, saying they could neither confirm nor deny the existence or non-existence of the information we were seeking. They've used a special part of the OIA, Section 10, saying that to confirm or deny the existence of information could prejudice the security or defence of New Zealand. And they add in their letter... Receiving a Section 10 neither confirm nor deny response should not lead you to conclude that the information you have asked for is either held or not held. Within the service itself, you can imagine that there are some people who've now read the file, but obviously they're not going to talk. There might be more, but by my count, there were seven people at the New Zealand Inn who must have known, going right up through the head of the SIS at the time to the Prime Minister, David Longy. But five of them are dead now. That leaves two. Yeah, so I've been in touch with a guy who ran operations on the ground from the New Zealand end. We can't use his real name, so we're going to call him Ben. Now, we've never met, but he could place me and seemed friendly enough. He said he was happy to talk if the service was happy. Yeah, but the service aren't happy. No, that's right. He went in and spoke with them. So he's out. The other one is Gerald Hensley, who was head of the Prime Minister's department when the raid happened. At that time, there was an operation targeting the Czechoslovakian embassy. Do you remember that? I remember it dimly, but those, that operational side was not my business to uh, inquire into, unless of course it went wrong. Um, so I just remember, I remember the occasion, but I couldn't remember any detail about it. So. When you say that you have a dim recollection that there was an operation involving the Czechoslovakian embassy, 
do you recall it being a successful operation? <laughs> no, you're pressing me on this one, Guy, and harder than, uh, uh, than I can go. I've really said all I can on this one. Mm. As I say, not my direct business, and uh, so therefore not mine to well, I, talk I, about. I appreciate that, but you are able to say, are you, that you, you can recollect an SIS operation on the Czechoslovakian embassy in coordination with MI6? record for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, John, I have to go to you. Sure, we, we, we should, we, we, we'll turn off the reporting devices. Yeah. Next time on The Service. At the time I was involved in this, the Soviet Union was extremely, in its dying days, was extremely active in in New Zealand and trying to penetrate our systems. That's Geoffrey Palmer, next time on The Service. The Service is made by RNZ and Bird of Paradise Productions with support from New Zealand On Air. It's hosted and produced by Guy Espiner and me, John Daniel, with additional reporting by Robert Breston. Our sound engineers are Adrian Holai and Rangi Powak. Our producer is William Ray. Thanks to Nga Taonga for the archival audio and to Anthony Tonnen for the original music throughout the series. The executive producers for RNZ are Tim Watkin and Veronica Schmidt.